Live from New York, another in a series of vital debates affecting the nation's future. Every third week in a special edition, an issue of local importance. Tonight, should public employees have the right to strike? On the platform, two eminent students of labor affairs, favoring the right of public employees to strike, Michael Quill, international president of the Transport Workers Union of America. Opposed, Fred Hartley, Jr., co-author of the Taft-Hartley Act. Our moderator, noted NBC News man and critic, John K.M. McCaffrey. In our New York audience, members of the press, representatives of many organizations with special interest in the subject. Now here is our moderator, John K.M. McCaffrey. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special half-hour edition of The Nation's Future. As you know, every third week we discuss a question of national impact, which also has particular local applications. And of course, our subject tonight is, should public employees have the right to strike? Now, if every public employee in the country struck all at once, we'd have some nine million people on strike, a great part of our labor force, and this would include firemen, uh, policemen, teachers, sanitation workers. Actually, at issue here is, is a very basic thing. Should the public employees have the same right to collective bargaining with its inherent right to strike as other employees, or should the public claim that their interest to maintain all essential services comes first and that there can be no right to strike? Well, now, to discuss this question with us here tonight, we have a man who says emphatically that public employees should have the right to strike, and he is a veteran of 30 years in the labor movement. He is president of the International Transport Workers Union. He is a member of the Executive Council of the AFL-CIO, Mr. Michael Quill. And Mr. Quill, will you tell us your position? Well, sir, I believe that all civil service employees should have the right to strike. They should have the right to genuine collective bargaining. They should have the right to a union shop agreement to a signed contract, to grievance machinery. They should have all the rights that every other American citizen have. Believe it or not, there are 8,300,000 civil service workers in this country. That's an army of people bigger than some European populations, some European countries' populations. We're talking this year, 1961, about the year of the new frontiers. These civil service workers remind me of the last brigade of the old frontier. <laughs> They're poorly paid. Their hours are not the best. Their working conditions are miserable. And they have absolutely no freedom. We have here in the city of New York 24,000 policemen. If there is any group of workers in America that's being treated like second-class citizens, it is the policemen of New York City and of many cities in between, from New York to the south to the west coast. I say that civil service employees, whether they are state troopers, city policemen, firemen, teachers, custom guards, prison guards, or anything else, that they should all have equal rights as American citizens. They should not take a second role. After having said this, I believe that strike is unnecessary. I believe that intelligent government in a county, city, or state of national basis can bring about such machinery whereby the employees can have genuine collective bargaining, like the Transport Workers Union have in New York City for 30,000 civil service subway workers who are civil service employees for the last 20 years. We have represented these workers since they were private employees for the last 30 years. And we have never struck the subways in New York for one hour in the last 30 years, last 27 years, last 20 years, last 15 years. If it can be done for civil service workers in the subways of New York, it can be done for policemen, for firemen, for the 1,500,000 teachers in this country who are being asked to teach without the protection of collective bargaining. And people will say, well, you're not supposed to have a union for teachers because it would be bad for the morale of the kids. I think it is worse for the morale of the kids to think that they are being taught by second-class citizens, by teachers who do not have a signed contract, by teachers who do not have recognition of their union, by teachers who do not have collective bargaining. It is for these reasons that I believe 
that the 8,300,000 civil service workers in the United States should take their rightful place along the ranks, along with the ranks of the other American citizens, with full collective bargaining and full job security. Thank you, Mr. Quill. Now, from the other side of the issue, we speak to another veteran in the labor field, an attorney, Mr. Fred Hartley, who was congressman from New Jersey from 1929 to 1948, and he was the author with the late Senator Taft of the famous Taft-Hartley bill. Now, Mr. Hartley, would you tell us your position on this issue? Well, Mr. McCaffrey and Mr. Quill, uh, let me say, first of all, I don't think there's any subject on which Mr. Quill and I would find ourselves in greater disagreement with one possible exception, that being the Taft-Hartley law, <laughs> uh, than we are on this particular subject. Uh, I am opposed to strikes by public employees, whether they be federal, municipal, or county, uh, because I believe that the public interest comes first. I believe that the public interest comes first. And I don't believe that a majority of Mr. Quill's own transport workers union want a strike and see tens and tens and hundreds of thousands of fellow workers inconvenience on their way to and from their jobs. I don't believe that a majority of the sanitation workers of the city of New York, or any other city for that matter, want to endanger the health of this city by striking and, and permitting garbage to pile up on the streets of this particular great uh, metropolis. I don't believe that the majority of the teachers want to strike and interfere with the orderly progress of the, our children and our grandchildren. And lastly, I certainly don't believe that the police and firemen want to risk uh, uh, sabotage, vandalism, and all sorts of things in a great city like this city and other cities throughout the United States by going out on strike. I prefer to think of those policemen and firemen as the men who went to that catastrophe in Brooklyn. Word called there, didn't get time and a half or double time for overtime or anything like that, went there because they saw a duty to perform and did it out of their uh, uh, public responsibility, just as the extra firemen who were not called out, but who went there voluntarily at that uh, uh, fire at, at the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard. Uh, I believe, uh, I'd like to read two statements, incidentally, in this connection. One by the late mayor of the city of New York, Fiorella LaGuardia. He wrote, and I'm only reading a part of this, the rapid transit system, including subways, elevated buses and trolleys owned by the city, are operated by the city for the benefit of the people of the city. This department is just as much a department of the city as the Department of Water Supply, Police Department, Fire Department, the schools, or any other branch of the city government. The city does not and cannot recognize the right of any group to strike against the city. I want to also read what the late President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said on this subject. He said, and I quote, a strike of public employees manifests nothing less than an intent on their part to obstruct the operations of government until their demands are satisfied. Such action looking toward the paralysis of, gov of government by those who are sworn to support it is unthinkable and intolerable. And let me say this, I take this position because I don't uh, support any attitude on the part of either an industrial giant or a labor leader who says the public be damned. Thank you very much, Mr. Hart. Now, gentlemen, you have a period of discussion where you may interrogate each other, cross-examine each other, or have at each other, depending upon uh, how you feel about it. Mr. Quill, we'll let you start the thought. I wish to say this to the audience, both here and outside, and to Congressman Hartley, that I qualified my statement by saying that intelligent management, either in government or in private ownership, along with intelligent leadership, can have a union can have collective bargaining and can do it without a strike, the same as we have done it in the subways. I'm not talking about what the majority of TWU men have or how they feel, but we have never struck the subways because we always found the collective bargaining door open to us. Mayor O'Dwyer opened it first, and Mayor Wagner had kept it open, and we have a signed contract, and we have the same responsibility towards the people of the city of New York that you have, sir, or any other body. I'm amazed to hear you quoting Franklin Roosevelt because <laughs> it is some switch when a Republican, an ex-congressman from the Republican Party, 
and the chosen mouthpiece of big business in America is falling back in Franklin D. Roosevelt as an authority on something. Well, that is yes, some well, switch, uh, and I thank you. Well, let me say this, Mr. Quill. Mr. Quill, I was expecting that uh, remark from you. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let me say this, that I'll quote anybody when he's right, and I'll quote you when you're right. Do you want to get a <laughs> From the position that you hold in big business, I don't think you'll ever quote me. <laughs> well, I will when you're right, as I said before. Now, let me, let me uh, see if we can understand uh, just what your position is. Uh, you support uh, the right of uh, any public employee, including the police and fire department, to go on strike? My position is that I support the right of all Americans to have full rights as an American. I support the right of every public employee to A, join a union, B, bargain collectively, and C, having the collective bargaining door close on their faces, then strike and remain on strike until that collective bargaining door is open. Well, what? That's my position. <laughs> Let me, let me ask you this. Why don't you devote more of your energies toward trying to set up some grievance procedure and some method of arbitration that will prevent these strikes? Oh, Mr. Hartley, they haven't told you things lately. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, yes. They haven't. Oh, well, they haven't, they, uh, they haven't told you because I advocated one. something along this line but 13 let years ago. Let me inform you, sir, that we have grievance machinery here, that after we sign a contract in the subways of New York, and in many places throughout the country, out to San Francisco and Seattle, we have what is known as an impartial chairman for the transit industry. In New York City is Theodore Keel, the impartial chairman for the entire subway and bus system of this city, both public and private. And that's how we place our contracts. His decision is final and binding when a grievance is taken. What happened to the Pennsylvania situation? In the Pennsylvania situation, it was the Pennsylvania Railroad, the citadel of big business. They were so used to breaking unions and breaking strikes for 114 years that they thought they'd break us too. We bargained with them for three years and three months and we couldn't move them. And after operation of 114 years, we struck them. And after 12 days, they found all the things that they couldn't have found in the three years previous to the date of strike. <laughs> Wouldn't it be good for them? That, in a nutshell, Congressman, is what happened to the Pennsylvania management. Congressman? Well, uh, uh, I, one other thing I was going to ask you there. Have, have, have you ever considered the possibility of setting up a, a sort of a labor court where these grievances might be uh, settled uh, to avoid strikes in public utilities, not only in municipalities, but in private industry as well? Congressman, I know you will excuse me when I have to inform you. I came from a land where we don't like courts, especially for labor unions. There is no need for a labor court. Mm. Sensible management and sensible union leadership can hammer it out across the collective bargaining table without strike in any industry. Well, why haven't you done it? We have done it. You didn't do it in the Pennsylvania No, situation. because the Pennsylvania didn't, was not prepared and it, to meet us. And, and the, you didn't do it in the steel industry, did you? I am not responsible for steel. But do you know why the steel workers <laughs> struck? They struck because the steel companies were trying to take back something that the steel workers won 20 years ago. And Dave MacDonald and the Steel Union did not allow them to do it. And you know what, you know what the result was, don't you? You know, you know what the result was? That they went out for 116 days and the workers lost $1,132,000,000 in wages. They went back under the Taft-Hartley law, which saved them over $600 million. Yes, and wages. they got an agreement before they went back, and it was nailed down. And they were upheld in the court in Philadelphia, where Arthur Goldberg, the next... Secretary of Labor took their case up, and the top Hartley law hadn't a thing to do oh, with yes, sending it. the steel workers back to work. And I tell you this, sir, well, just moment, if Mr. they Clark. had to go out again to protect their union, they'd go out for another 116 days to keep the union in the steel mills. Uh, 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 <laughs> that was kind of a double-barreled statement, Congressman Hartley. You could take them up in order if you'd like. Well, I, what I started to say was the Taft Hartley law actually did settle the strike. It was settled during the 80-day waiting period. And instead of being down at the union hall singing solidarity forever at Christmas time, the wives of the steel workers had paychecks. And I will say, <laughs> and I will say this: that the Taft-Hartley law is as outmoded as the invention of the wheel. 
We have come to the new age, sir. We are talking now about the new frontier, about collective bargaining for the forgotten men and women of America, the 8,300,000 who do not have well, Mr. collective Mr. bargaining. Mr. Brewer, you, you've, made, you've been making statements like that ever since the Taft Harley law has been on the statute books. Why haven't you repealed it? And would you, make, would you like a little, uh, make a little bet on the side after this program is over that you won't do it under the Kennedy administration? I, 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 never, I, never, I never go to the track. But I will say this, that your own President Eisenhower said in the 1956 campaign that the Taft-Hartley law was an evil law and that his purpose was to break the unions and it should be amended. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, no. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, no. Oh, no. President, President Eisenhower never made such a statement. He made a statement to the AFL convention in which he said there was a union busting provision in the law and that has been taken out. President Eisenhower said the Taft-Hartley law was an evil law, that, was a, that it was a union busting law and that if re-elected he would amend it. He never said that. And he was your president and, and my president, and but he was way, from your party. Yeah, well, why would bring it up? <laughs> While, 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 we're that, while this thing is getting a little bit political, because I happen to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, quote uh, the late President Roosevelt, uh, you're talking about a lack of grievance machinery, and you're talking about it in a, on a Democratic administration here in the, in the city of New York. We have it for some of the industries. We have it in sanitation. Why don't you have it for the teachers? The Why don't you have it for the police? Why don't you have it for the firemen? It should be for the police. I uh, said that sure. the police were treated here like jungle animals. And I said that they will break out of their cage and that they better join legitimate labor union uh, thought with. But it's under a democratic administration, isn't it? Yes. Right. Yes, and we're working towards it. And I was hoping that you would throw your great weight in that direction, too. I've got great weight over here, yes. <laughs> well, let me say, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm what? all for that. Definitely. Well, then, this, this thing is, we're getting nowhere, then we're fully agreed. This oh, no. oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> this, this gentleman believes that the police should have the right to a union, the firemen, I the believe, teachers, wait a minute, sanitation oh, workers. Don't, just, just a minute, don't, Mr. Quill. Well, just a minute. I think that Mr. Hartley uh, knows what he said. Yeah. Don't, don't misquote me on that score. I didn't. <laughs> I said that they have the right to a, a policeman's benevolent association, a fireman's a mutual uh, a benevolent association, and I believe that the teachers have the right to, uh, to be organized and all that, but I don't believe that they have the right to strike because I think the public interest is paramount. Yes, they don't have the right to strike. No. Well, then, the fastest way, the fastest way of stopping them of striking is giving them full freedom, give them unionization, give them collective bargaining. I think the police commissioner Kennedy in New York is wrong in the way he's treating the police, and I say that the commissioners throughout the country who are keeping the police and firemen and teachers down are wrong. Well, gentlemen, uh, uh, couldn't you uh, say that your difference comes clearly uh, into focus here with the fact that you will not, you say that we must have collective bargaining, Mr. Quill, and which the right to strike is always there. That's the threat that makes it work. You, Congressman Hartley, want grievance machinery set up and there is no right to strike, although That's the right. grievances are taken care of. So the right to strike is right in the center of this. You would not give up your right to strike, would you, Mr. Quill? No, sir, and you and your union would not give up your right to strike either. You belong to a very strong union. <laughs> and I know that if your organization decided by a majority vote to strike tomorrow, that you would be carrying the picket sign and you would be calling upon Congressman Hartley to help you. <laughs> Mr. Quill, well, no, well, no, that's a, a picture just, I would no, cherish. Just Mr. a moment. <laughs> All right. All right. If you've got a camera, can focus on it? I don't, I don't think we can, well, Congressman. There's a picture of me in the picket line, the CIO picket line. I don't think we can get close enough to a camera. Well, try it on this camera. Here is Representative Hartley on a picket line. Can, do we get it at all, Chuck? I think not. I think it's too small. Go ahead. What, right. Let me say about, oh. about this token picket line you were on, that don't impress me. There was me. no token picket Wait line. Wait a while. A lot of employers take cards out of their pockets and they say, I was in so There's so the picture, ladies ago. and gentlemen, of, of uh, Mr. Hartley on a picket line. What was this picket line? Was but, it a and by the way, talking about politics again, the company whose plant I picketed with the CIO textile workers was owned by the senior Republican senator from my own state. So there wasn't any politics in that. Oh, I have no doubt. I wouldn't charge Mr. Hartley with politics when he goes in a picket line. It is very handy for the election. It is very handy for the election. When an employer, when an employer or an employer's agent takes a union book out of his pocket and say, I was a union man one time, it makes no impression on me. 
because Hitler had a card in the Panthers Union of Germany, <laughs> and that madman almost ruined the world. That's a token picket line. I wish that Mr. Hartley didn't try to pass the Taft Hartley law. I wish he was on the side of labor and not on the side of management. Oh, well, now, coming to that, because I expected these issues to be raised. Do you, have, do you know, Mr. Quill, that I happen to have been the spokesman for the American Federation of Labor on the Republican side of the House for 12 of my 20 years in Congress? Don't boast too much about it, because you had been the spokesman since for the National Association oh, of Manufacturers. Oh, never, never. So the American Federation of Labor didn't do very much good for you. I no, wish but I know, but I did a lot of good for the American Federation of oh, Labor. Well, Congressman, I'm thankful for all the good favors you have done. <laughs> Congressman. Might I ask you a question, just as representing the public here, would, do you advocate, then, compulsory arbitration in I, this I area? Believe, I believe it ought to be given study, yes. I, I, I do believe that Congress ought to consider the question of, of uh, uh, setting up uh, labor courts, where just as we go in to settle the dispute between uh, uh, two of us on many other issues, and we abide by the outcome, I think we might at least try that and see if we could, uh, couldn't cut out these strikes where the public is the innocent uh, victim. That's what I do believe. Congressman, don't you agree, really, that the teachers have been studied to death, and the firemen and the sanitation workers the right and the prison keepers and the federal employees have been studied? All we hear is one study after another. In the name of God, let us do oh, something. Well, that's, Give what them collective that's, what that's what I'm suggesting. That's, and by the way, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, what was your opinion about the strike at... Uh, uh, Cape Canaveral and, uh, and uh, the Vandenberg Air, Air Base. Did you approve of that strike? Those oh, strikes? I'll tell you, I have 4,000 men at the Cape, and they struck for four days one time, and with uh, one of the generals down there, we got the collective bargaining table to work, and we settled it and got them back to work with a signed contract. Yeah. At collective in other words, in other words you, you approved the uh, strike at Cape Canaveral I approved when, it. when we were in a life and death struggle to get these ah. missiles. Now, let's go back to your own history. Mm -hmm. When you were in the Congress, did you vote against Lend-Lease? No, I voted for Lend-Lease on final passage. You did? Yes. And what about the other measures that Roosevelt threw into the hopper at that time? Did you vote what? for them that time? What, what for The example? various other measures? I voted for everything that, for our, everything that was ever asked for by our Army, Navy, and Air yeah. Force. For, yes. the, for the defense of this country. De definitely. And still, and still you come out and you would deny, you would, de you would deny 8,300,000 people the right to collective bargaining? Not to collective and the bargaining, right to but not Congress? the right to strike. Not the right to strike. Definitely. But what is the use? when you have a stubborn employer at the other side of the table if you don't have the weapon of strike? The, the answer is to go to the public and get the, uh, the benefit of public opinion back again. And, what and there's, the, there's nothing stronger than the... Than the what uh, will uh, public, public opinion do with a stubborn employer like the Pennsylvania Railroad Management? We're talking what about public employees, employees now. We're talking about I'm the, talking yes. about public and private employees. Yes. I'm talking about civil service workers at the federal level, the state level, the city level, and the county level. Public opinion is not moving Commissioner Kennedy with the New York City Police, and he's still denying him well, the right to meet. It, it moved the Congress to pass the Landrum Griffin Bill. I know, but did it help the police department in New York City? Or did it help the 8,500, 400, or 300,000? Did what help them? <laughs> Public opinion helped the 8,300,000. Well, the 8,300,000 civil service workers who, who, to get the right to collect who, who, bargaining. Who, whose fault is that? Maybe they, maybe they haven't been doing a good public relations job. I don't know about that, but you're telling me that public opinion is the key to everything. I think public and all they have to is do the strongest is, force there is in the United States. And all the workers have to do is take low wages, take low wages, take bad working conditions, have no grievance machinery, oh, and wait I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm not suggesting well, that at all. May I ask well, the reverse of my opinion, question you? to you, Mr. Quill? Yes, sir. Uh, do you object to compulsory arbitration in these cases? Of course. And why? Because it is the very same as the labor front that Hitler had in Germany. Compulsory arbitration, you're over a battle. No labor union have a chance with compulsory arbitration because the papers are against us. The press generally is against us. Sometimes the radio is against us. Despite the sympathy we may have from you and other commentators, the <laughs> medium of the <laughs> is also against us. That's a great public relations job you're doing, Mr. Quill. <laughs> you see, all these channels of, uh, <coughs> of getting your information across is in the hands of big business, is in the hands of the employers. We in the labor movement don't have a chance. We have to have a strong union. Yes. And you never get anything without fighting for it.
You'd say the American Arbitration Association was in the hands of big business? The American Arbitration Association has arbitrated. They're not compulsory. No, no, they're but not. We're talking about compulsory arbitration. I am against compulsory arbitration. So now then, Mr. Hartley, uh, do you feel that uh, we could get a climate in which these things could be taken care of without, the, uh, without one pressure group being more important than another? In a grievance well, setup? I, I agree that that's uh, going to be a difficult problem because uh, there are some uh, leaders uh, in the labor movement who are uh, uh, very aggressive, such as Mr. Quill, and uh, I think he's done a pretty good job for his people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> the congressman is very generous. <laughs> and I wish you were on the side of labor instead of the side of big business. You could be more helpful. Well, I, well, mister, uh, I'd, I'd rather have a question come uh, because I, uh, well, I, I, I just uh, still take the position that these strikes, many of them are unnecessary and that all of them should be outlawed, particularly when the innocent public is the real victim. I agree with the congressman. I agree with the congressman that strikes are unnecessary. But when you have bullheaded management at the other side of the table, the workers have nothing else to do but hit the picket line, as Mr. Hartley did hit the picket line, as he showed here in television. Well, uh, well, uh, I want well, to congratulate Mr. you for being on my side of the fence, even for only 10 minutes. Well, no, I wasn't on your side for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. And, and, and uh, let me say this, that uh, uh, I have sat in on many an arbitration and many a council between labor and management, particularly uh, uh, before 1942. And let me say this, that all the bullheadedness is not on the side of management. Yeah, now you're <laughs> well, uh, of, course, of course, you probably have very wide experience. I have only dealt with managements in the transit field, and I have uh, found them very bullheaded. <laughs> and I have always found them that they were able to find money the day after the strike, but they could never find money the day before the strike. Where were they hiding it? Why couldn't they drag it out before the strike? And why the strike? And not inconvenience the public. I'm against strikes. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad you're coming around to my side. No. <laughs> I'm against strikes. <laughs> This, uh, this has turned out to be a love match. First he accuses me of being on his side, and, and now I, I will admit that he's on my side. I am impressed since I saw the congressman's picture on the picket line that he's a radical like myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, gentlemen, that I, I don't think we've had here any love feast. Whatever else it may have been, I myself have thoroughly enjoyed it from beginning to end. And to the ladies and gentlemen who are listening outside, I would like to say that we are very grateful for your kind support and uh, to the uh, nation's future, to this kind of programming. Many, many, many thousands of you have written in, and we are very grateful that you have. We would like to answer all your letters personally. So far, it has not been possible to do that. But even so, we are grateful, and uh, this is the kind of thing that we'll be giving you in the weeks to come. So then, this is John McCaffrey saying good night after a little love feast. Next week at the same time, another debate on a vital issue affecting the nation's future. Our subject, should medical care for the aged be linked to Social Security? In favor, Senator Hubert H. Humphrey, Democrat of Minnesota. Opposed, representing the views of the American Medical Association, Dr. Edward R. Annis. It is one week from tonight on The Nation's Future. Tomorrow night, the entire family will want to see the whimsical and fascinating story of Pippi Longstockings on the Shirley Temple Show in color. Pippi lives in a house with a horse, a monkey, and a chest full of gold, left by her father who ran off to become a cannibal king. Don't miss this tale of the unpredictable Pippi on the Shirley Temple Show tomorrow night at 7, 6 central time on NBC. This is Bill Hanrahan saying good night. <laughs>